Um, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Lynn Riedel, who is going to tell us about the Colorado Natural Areas Program, which is um, involved in conserving biological and geological diversity across Colorado. And it's been going on since 1977, and it recognizes and protects natural areas in Colorado with unique or high quality features of statewide significance. And she's going to be telling us um, about, especially about four areas in Colorado, ranging from um, wetlands areas up to the mountains. And it, I think we'll all learn a lot about this very intriguing program that most of us probably don't know too much about. But Lynn has been involved in um, grasslands, ecology, and natural area management and conservation for years. She's now with the, well, she's been part of the um, Boulder City, City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks Department as their plant ecologist. And um, I've known Lynn for many years and been on field trips with her. And she, it's a delight to be with her and ask questions about what's that and what's that. And she tells such wonderful stories. So tonight she's going to tell us some stories about the Natural Areas Program. Lynn? Lynn, you can fire up your slides and unmute. I think you are unmuted now. I'm unmuted now and I'm trying to get back to my shared screen. Do you see my screen? Not yet, we don't. We see you. <laughs> okay. Um, Share screen at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then you should see some choices to share your PowerPoint window. Yes, just like we did. <laughs> Perfect. Seemed like it worked. All right, great, thank you. And thanks everyone for asking me to speak tonight and, and for being here. Um, and we'll start by saying that I have long been an admirer of the Colorado Natural Areas Program. And, um, and I'm looking forward to taking you on a tour of some of the designated natural areas across the state and the Boulder area. Um, the four regions sort of in Colorado that um, Carol mentioned, there are actually more natural areas I'll take you through than the than four. Um, and then I just wanted to mention that this beautiful scene here on the intro slide is one of the natural areas. It is the um, Orient Mine natural area. And this is looking out over the northern part of the San Luis Valley. And in this old mine, there um, are in the summer 100,000 to 250,000 Brazilian free-tailed bats that roost and um, this is the largest bat roost site known in Colorado. The Natural Areas Program uh, mission is to identify, evaluate, and support the protection of specific examples of natural features and phenomena as enduring resources for present and future generations through a statewide system of designated natural areas. And the vision also for designated natural areas is to provide educational and uh, research opportunity as well. And there, I'll just, here I'll mention, a lot of people are confused uh, or get the Natural Heritage Program and the Natural Areas Program, Colorado Natural Heritage and Colorado Natural Areas confused. It makes sense that you would. Um, if you're not familiar with the programs, they definitely work together, uh, these two programs, a lot. Um, nat 
CNAP, I, as I will refer it, um, I will refer it to that uh, by that, the Colorado Natural Areas Program uh, is a state program, uh, and it is housed with, or it is a program within the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, CNHP, Colorado Natural Heritage Program, is a quasi-governmental entity and is associated with Colorado State University. But the two interact, um, as I said, and work on projects together. And in fact, um, CNAP actually contracts a natural heritage program botanist full time to work for the natural areas program. Um, and because the, the, the CNAP staff is quite small. This uh, in the background here is the High Creek Fen State Natural Area. So as Carol mentioned in the introduction, the natural areas program was, um, the statute was enacted in 1977 uh, by the Colorado Natural Areas Act. And it's, a, as I mentioned, it was a program, it's a program within the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, natural areas, designated natural areas um, are voluntary. Uh, it's voluntary for the landowner to designate their land and the ownership and managers, management responsibilities are retained by the landowner. Um, and there aren't regulatory, um, it, there is nothing regulatory imposed. Uh, the area does have to be publicized, uh, uh, excuse me, does not have to be public. And so uh, in the 95 designated natural areas that we have now, um, some are public, open to the public and some are not. And that the, the natural areas total over 180,000 acres across the state at this time. The Natural Areas Act also um, created a, a seven member council to advise the natural areas program. And um, two of those, those members, one is a, a parks and wildlife commission representative. The other, uh, another is a state land board um, commission or state land board representative. And then the rest are governor appointees. And then you can see down on this chart that about a third of the natural areas are owned by the Bureau of Land, land Management or on BLM land. And then nearly a quarter are state land board. And uh, then in the vicinity of 10% um, for private land, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and also Forest Service and then local government uh, less and National Park Service. Also, I meant to mention that Raquel Wurtzbaugh is the program coordinator currently, and Savannah Smith is the Colorado, Colorado Natural Heritage Program botanist um, who is contracted and working with C CNAP at this point. So you get a, a look at the spread of those 95 natural areas and you can see that the mountains are well represented, um, the Western Slope and sort of the Colorado Plateau portions of Colorado are, uh, that area is well represented, but there's a large gap here in the Eastern Plains. And a uh, focus for CNAP in the future is going to be to designate more state natural areas in the um, Eastern part of the state. So there are more than 250 rare, threatened, or endangered plants, plant communities, and wildlife that are monitor monitored and cooperatively protected on natural areas. And CNAP is the only program within the state government that focuses on rare plants. And these pictures I have to share with you, you probably know um, that this is, but. Um, but I will say that this is a swift, pot, swift fox and pup, and this is at Two Buttes Natural Area in southeastern Colorado. Um, then volcanic ash pinnacles at Wheeler Geologic Natural Area in the middle on the top, and a twin pod in northeastern or northwestern Colorado, Visaria congesta, and it's obligate to shale barrens there. And then a remarkably large um, 
<laughs> ammonite. Uh, it's a fossilized giant ammonite at the Kremlin Cretaceous Ammonite Locality Natural Area. And a beautiful meadow, alpine wet meadows at Treasure Vault Mountain Natural Area. We've, um, as we put this, uh, the staff at CNAP helped put this um, presentation together and we wanted to focus on birds <laughs> appropriately for Audubon Society. Um, and I just wanted to mention the um, State Wildlife Action Plan that many of you, all of you are familiar with probably. Um, and, and the action <clears throat> State Wildlife Action Plan uh, creates a list of tier one or highest conservation priority species and um, also tier two of next highest um, priority. And in it, in the current swap, and I'll refer to it as a swap, um, there are 13 tier one birds and 48 tier two birds. And here are some examples of those. And pictured here is a white-tailed, southern white-tailed ptarmigan and a little burring owl in the background. Audubon important bird areas overlap with quite a few uh, state natural areas, 14 of them. And we'll be point, I'll be pointing out several of those. And of course the designation priorities for the important bird areas are uh, often overlap with the designation priorities for the state natural area. Uh, the, uh, the global IBAs are shown in red and the state level um, important bird areas are in green. So we'll now look at a sampler of natural areas across the state, um, many of which provide good bird habitat. And this picture is of um, showing Geneva Basin Iron Fen natural area. And it, it is one of only a few iron fens no, known to exist in the world. Uh, iron fens are a specialized wetland type with an acidic pH, but high nutrient content, a result of groundwater flowing over pyrite rich rock. Apologies, phone in the background. Aiken, County, Aiken Canyon is named after Charles Aiken, one of the first ornithologists to survey Colorado in the early 1870s and remains an intact example of a foothills ecosystem. It's near Canyon, not far from Canyon City along the Southern Front Range. The site is an Audubon designated important bird area as well as a Colorado watchable wildlife site. The area supports good quality ponderosa pine woodlands, shrubland plant communities of special concern and grasslands, all among the red outcrops of the fountain formation. And more than a hundred species of birds have been documented on the site. Um, the Nature Conservancy, which um, manages the property, uh, operates bird point counts and this includes raptors, prairie falcons, golden eagles, and just many species. In addition to the high avian diversity, the site also contains a concentration of other wildlife, including the Colorado checkered whiptail, a species of special concern, and it's pictured here. The Comanche lesser prairie chicken natural area is in another corner of the state. Um, this site used to be an impo very important for the lesser prairie chicken, but populations have declined to the point that they are no longer present. And the Colorado Parks and, Wi Colorado Parks and Wildlife reintroduction projects are working to restore them. The Comanche National Grassland site historically contained the largest concentration of lex for the state threatened lesser prairie chicken in, in the whole state. Um, and of course the lex or the mate mating display grounds. The dense sand sage and shortgrass prairie communities there um, provide critical habitat for this species as well as other important bird species, including the Cassin sparrow, grasshopper sparrow and fruginous hawks. And I'm not going to repeat all of the information in these um, blocks because I imagine that you can read them as I'm talking 
about the size of the area and the landowner and county and so forth. Another one, and I heard some people talking <laughs> before the meeting about this site um, close to us is the Dakota Hogback Natural Area. And that is uh, overlaps with the dino Dinosaur Ridge um, important bird area. Uh, <clears throat> and this is the only regularly staffed hawk watch site coordinated by the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. And it contains the highest tallies of migrating ferruginous hawks in the world. Also pictured here is a rare plant, uh, Fisaria vitellifera, it's Rydberg's um, twin pod, which is similar to our Bell's twin pod, a, a rel close relative. And we actually have this Rydberg's in, um, in the Boulder area. And you can see the dinosaur tracks. The prominent ridge, which forms the primary feature of the natural area, provides excellent illustrations of the geology of the Dakota hogback. <clears throat> <clears throat> Dinosaur Ridge, a national natural landmark paleontological site, is included in the natural area. Here, dinosaur tracks, plants, and trace fossils are well exposed in this hogback of Morrison shales, capped by Dakota sandstone. There's also Zurich Tallgrass Prairie found along with woodlands, foothills woodlands. And then zooming out to the Eastern Prairie, this um, Fox Ranch is a registered state, or a registered natural area. So its designation is pending. It was nearly, it was ready to be designated last year, but because of the pandemic, it has been postponed. Hopefully it, uh, the full designation process can be completed this year. And, um, that brings up the, um, the process of designated natu natural areas. First, the uh, natural area is identified as a potential natural area, then registered and, and finally designated with more of a formal process and an, um, articles of designation are drawn up. Uh, the Green Mountain um, natural area, which ended up being the Boulder Mountain Park natural area, uh, sat in the uh, registered natural area uh, category for a very long time until we finally designated it. But the, um, the Fox Ranch is home to excellent examples of lust soils, mixed grass, and sand sage plant communities, as well as a suite of fish, native fish, grassland birds, and other grassland specific riparian and aquatic species. The, pro the property provides crucial sand sage recharge zones for the groundwater dependent Arikari River, as well as habitat for numerous threatened species. And here the greater prairie chicken is pictured, which the regular at the Fox Ranch. Tamarack Ranch is another Eastern Prairie um, site, um, natural area. Uh, and it includes, it includes quality plains, cottonwood repairing woodlands, as well as intact Santos Prairie in the uplands. Here, the cottonwood riparian woodlands line a portion of the broad meandering South Platte River and provide important habitat for migrating waterfowl, as well as several riparian species, including a, the common garter snake, which is rare in Colorado. The Sandhills community provides habitat for the greater prairie chicken also. And this is part of a larger site managed as the Tamarack Ranch State Wildlife Area, which you can visit. And then Treasure Vault Mountain is not an area that is open to the public. It's a state land board property. It is located in the Mosquito Range. It supports several rare and uncommon species of plants and wildlife uh, adapted to the extreme conditions found in Colorado's alpine areas. The natural area contains federally, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the federally threatened um, Mosquito Range mustard, Eutrema penlandia, Penlandii, as well as a number of state rare, uh, other state rare plant, plant species. And um, it's home to alpine wildlife species such as the brown capped rosy finch, white tailed ptarmigan, and the American pika. Just beautiful. Then, down in another part of this, on the western slope, is the Una Weeps Seep natural area. 
this area um, notes here about the visitation say that there really aren't trails and travel is difficult and, and not really recommended due to um, lots of poison ivy and also the wetlands that are the reason, much of the reason for the um, designation of this area. Although it's an important bird area as well. Um, the Unaweep Sweep Natural Area, Seep Natural Area, contains a large wetland complex fed by hillside seeps. There is an exceptional diversity of wetland types, including marshes, wet meadows, seeps, willow thickets, and lush riparian woodlands. The seeps support an extensive population of the giant hellebore orchid, Epipactus gigantea, and a rich concentration of wildlife species, as one can imagine. And previous surveys have recognized the unparalleled density of birds, leading to its recognition as an Audubon important bird area. And then Zapata Falls is just a lovely magical place. It's at the edge of the San Luis Valley near the great sand dunes national park. And the valley above the falls was the site of an enormous glacier during the last ice age. Lateral moraines show that the glacier terminated just above the falls. And as the glacier receded, meltwater loaded with sand and rock cut the notch of the falls in into Pre-Cambrian crystalline rocks and resulted in the formation of a dramatically carved gorge. It is one of the few known Colorado breeding sites for the rare black swift. And that's a bird that nests, ex nests exclusively in the dark recesses and spray of large waterfalls and also spends most of their waking hours in continuous flight. Then the Bogosa Sky Rocket Natural Area is another one that actually isn't open to the public. It's owned by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, it's found within one of, or within the Pagosa Sky Rocket Natural Area is found, um, excuse me, is one of two known Pagosa Sky Rocket populations in the whole world. And both of which are found within 10 miles of the town of Pagosa Springs. So that's a very, very tight endemic sort of distribution um, for a plant. And its Latin name is Ipomopsis polyacantha, or polyantha, sorry. Um, and the property, as it says here on the banner, um, harbors at least 50% of all the known individuals of the species in the world. And it's an endangered species. Um, protected by the uh, Endangered Species Act. And this is an opportunity to show, just you can see that this is an intensive monitoring project. And this is one that CNAP has uh, embarked on in partnership and coordination with the Colorado Natural Heritage Program. And since 2017, and, and the Fish and Wildlife Service in cooperation, uh, since it's an endangered species, um, and in the four years or so that they've been monitoring the plant, um, the, they found that the population numbers are relatively stable, which is good news, and they're learning a lot more about um, microhabitat preferences for this plant. So that's just a demonstration that uh, the Natural Areas Program actually does quite a bit of monitoring on these um, biologically diverse sites to help with their conservation. And in fact, the staff has a rotation of visiting all 95 natural areas on a three-year rotation, and then many of uh, to monitor conditions, and sometimes to monitor very specifically like this. Uh, volunteer, there are also um, a suite of volunteer stewards who monitor annually at many of the natural areas, not all of them, but many of them across the state. And then we'll move to our own backyard. <laughs> we'll shift the tour. Um, and Boulder, you may or may not know, has four designated state natural areas, the Boulder Mountain Park, Colorado Tallgrass Prairie, and South Boulder Creek and White Rocks. And there's been a long time partnership between the Colorado Natural Areas Program and the City of Boulder Open Space 
and mountain parks focused on the conservation of these biologically rich sites. But I can't resist here to just um, back up a little bit and um, set the stage looking at some of the factors that make our, our, our county so biologically rich. And this is just a, a excerpts from this fit my uh, favorite biogeographical write-up by Dr. William Weber, a longtime curator of the CU Herbarium and who just passed away about a year ago um, at the age of 101. And so many contributions he made, and this is um, from a, a vascular plant checklist that he did for Boulder County. And I'll just uh, read some excerpts because I think this is important for us to keep in mind. And it may be something you know well, but I just want to um, revisit this with everyone. He says, the topographical situation of Boulder County is unique as the point on the North American continent where the continental divide reaches its easternmost approach and its steepest gradient and shortest distance between the high peaks and the plains. And the flat irons form a wall on which under certain climatic influences, cloud veils form and create local wet conditions, mesic conditions. And we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more um, later. And then the continental divide <clears throat> on the Western boundary of the county um, Within a few miles, as the crow flies, one can encounter all of the floristic regions of the eastern slope of the Front Range, from the plains to the alpine tundra. And that's all in our county. And he goes on to say, uh, you know, to say that there are uh, about 1,500 vascular plants in the 750 square miles of Boulder County, about half of the plant species in the state. So, yeah. So here is a little graphic description, uh, depiction of that veering east near Boulder and Denver of the Continental Divide. The combination of higher precipitation levels, um, the diversity of habitats formed by dramatic topo topography, the blending of Great Plains and Rocky Mountain flora and fauna, and the conservation of natural ecosystems has resulted in an the remarkable biological diversity that we see today in Boulder County. And then I have a few fun composite slides just to, um, <laughs> I can't see my slide very well. Oops, sorry. Well, uh, this is the fourth, uh, or our, the front range is the, the fourth, fourth most diverse area for butterflies. Um, in on the North American continent or in North America. And uh, Boulder County has uh, more mammal species than a couple of our neighboring states. And then um, you all know more about this than I do and are familiar with, um, there's a breeding bird survey site down at the base of El Dorado Mountain at the um, forest, prairie, ecotone, uh, that ended up being the richest site in the state with 101 species. And I believe that was the breeding bird survey prior to the most recent one. So now we'll dive into our natural areas. And Boulder Mountain Park um, extends from, it's a sizable park it's, uh, or um, natural area. It extends from um, Boulder Canyon to near El Dorado Canyon. It includes the flat the flat irons, um, which uh, you know, the 300 million year old fountain formation and one of the best known and most spectacular geologic features in Colorado. Um, it includes Eastern woodland plant communities that I'll talk more about, just relics from uh, the end of the last ice age. And uh, you know, Green Mountain, South Boulder Peak, Bear Peak, the backside of the mountains, um, all of that is held within this natural area. Some lovely photos of the diversity in <clears throat> our Boulder Mountain Park. We have wood lilies and calypso orchids and 
um, then these moist spring-fed canyons. This is a very rare orchid in, <clears throat> in uh, Colorado. It is found in northern boreal forests. Here it, it, it's about two inches tall and very, very hard to find. And in fact, we haven't found it for a, a number of years. It grows a little taller in Minnesota. Then um, paper birch is part of that eastern woodland relict community that I'll, I, I will talk a little more about. And then uh, things like this lovely little fern that is uh, a cliff dwelling fern that is found in the Mesa de Maya region, uh, southeastern Colorado, and here in, on Flagstaff Mountain, and nowhere in between that we are aware of. And to go a little bit more into this um, uh, Eastern Woodland relict, we have um, the overstory of paper birch and um, the understory of big hazelnut and so many plants that are associated with these moist canyons and bowls um, on north and northeast facing on Green Mountain. And the, these areas are fed by springs and they, they're micro habitats um, that um, provide uh, the right conditions for plants that were much more widespread 10,000 years ago. Um, these communities were, this Eastern Woodland-like community um, was much more widespread 10,000 years ago, but our climate is warmed and dried. And these relics are just tucked away and extremely special now um, in nooks and crannies on uh, Green Mountain. And then we have our large mammals and small mammals and um, raptors, cliff nesting raptors. And, and here in the middle is the Townsend's big eared bat, which is extremely rare in the state. And it can be found drinking in the pools at the bottom of canyons. Um, OSMP provides two of only a few known roost sites for town, the Townsend's bigger bat in all of the Front Range. And, and those are in Mallory and Harmon Caves. They're rare maternal colonies and the, and the caves have been protected now to keep people out, out of them. And then there are very, very uncommon birds further away from the city, further away from where people um, spend time uh, in Boulder Mountain Park, such as the flammulated owl and the goshawk, rarely seen. And then I wanted to mention that uh, just to highlight how very biologically diverse Boulder Mountain Park is, the Natural Areas Program uh, in the last couple of years devised a ranking tool uh, to rank the values of the natural areas and rank they put all 95 um, natural areas through this ranking tool with various criteria. And Boulder Mountain Park came out right on top of all 95 um, natural areas across the state. And the staff thought, oh, that's odd because you know it's near the urban edge and um, how could that be? And so they ran it through again and sure enough, Boulder Mountain Park comes out on top. <laughs> so that's just an indication of, of what we have here. Um, measured against other places in the state. And then here is an example of our, you know, our foothills, drainages, narrowleaf cottonwood transitioning into the plains. And that brings us to Colorado Tallgrass Prairie State Natural Area, one of the oldest, um, earliest designated. Uh, and you can see it's a patchwork of isolated, just isolated patches, properties, um, the smallest, only a couple of acres and uh, the larger patches are about a hundred acres. And it was designated to preserve uh, music or wet Tallgrass Prairie, mostly in the South Boulder Creek floodplain, and Zurich Tallgrass Prairie, which I'll talk about just a little bit more. 
And we know that tall grass prairie is among the rarest and most imperiled ecosystems in the world. Um, and due to boulders, rocky soils weren't plowed <laughs> and local land preservation, we have more than 5,000 acres of tall grass prairie today that's protected. And this um, the ecotonal blend of prairie and montane plants that we have in the Boulder area is an especially rare tall grass type. And tall grass prairie um, was noted in Boulder by early botanists and ecologists. And in the uh, 1970s and 80s, a local group of naturalists and ecologists lobbied the open space program to, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to be on that slide, sorry. Um, lobbied the open space program uh, to purchase uh, more, prop to purchase tall grass prairie, um, good quality examples in the south, so sort of southeast of Boulder. And CNAP and um, so Colorado Natural Areas Program and a, tall and a tall grass committee that was formed helped open space to develop a management plan, monitor vegetation, and even to conduct prescribed burns at the time. The open space program was very, was quite small then. And now we have a valuable 30 year vegetation monitoring data set that came out of all of that assistance. And because more tall grass prairie has been purchased by um, the city of Boulder over the last 30 years, and tall grass communities have recovered under improved management, CNAP and OSMP are working on expanding the natural area boundaries to include more than a thousand additional acres. So it will no longer look like that little patchwork of properties in the future. And um, it, you know, the music prairies, um, provide habitat for bobolink and other birds that um, need that sort of dense, taller vegetation. Uh, and this is um, a skipper. Um, it's either an Argos or a crossline, and some of you will know. And um, I am sorry that I didn't make note of which one it was, but those, um, the Argos and the crossline are rare skippers. They're rare butterflies that are um, that are rare all the way across the, the Great Plains. And they're found associated with big and little blue stem, which is, you know, those are the, some of the main species or key characteristic species of tall grass prairie. So here along the front range, we have these rare skippers because of our tall grass prairies. And the Zurich tall grass prairie with um, shorter vegetation and more, openings, bare ground openings, uh, provides excellent habitat for grasshopper, for various sparrows. And here we have a grasshopper sparrow singing away with a lot of bird bands on it. And um, a vesper sparrow perched very appropriately on a grassland nesting bird closure sign um, showing that, uh, or it's an example of open space and mountain parks has a number of ground nesting bird, um, grassland nesting bird closures in, in some of our larger blocks of habitat. And often these are in this xeric tall grass. And this may be, um, may be a Vesper sparrow nest. It's just lovely. And then uh, something to just drink in the, the music prairie, Christopher Brown photo. And South Boulder Creek State Natural Area is um, 1,200 acres or so that stretches from the Flatirons Golf Course uh, all the way through the South Boulder Creek Corridor South um, to Marshall Road and Highway 93. It includes the South Boulder Creek floodplain and irrigated upland terraces, um, stream terraces. It is also a very rich area um, and it contains the largest, well, one of the largest known pop, one of the largest populations of the Ute Ladies Tresses orchid, which is a threatened species and has 
formerly critical habitat, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service critical habitat for the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse and a good population of the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse. Lovely wet meadows. Again, the bobolink <laughs> is a star, <laughs> or really, you know, is one of the um, organ, uh, is one of the birds that enjoys this habitat. And um, very good quality riparian um, corridor, uh, riparian plant communities. And uh, they're also um, native fish and other you know, sort of wetland and tall grass nesting bird habitat. And then the northern leopard frog as well. And that's uh, the northern leopard frog has been um, is a priority state priority species. It has been declining across um, the West and certainly in Colorado, but the South Boulder Creek corridor contains excellent habitat and good some good populations of the Northern leopard frog. It's just a lovely stream. And then we'll go to White Rocks, which is, um, the oldest natural area we have is designated in 1979. And it is 100 acres, but it, it's, it's quite small compared to the landscape it is in. And it does not encompass all of the um, Fox Hill sandstone cliffs. And you can see it's, this is 75th Street and then 95th would be to the east. It is a biological hotspot. I mean, all of these have been that I've been talking about, but this is just, <laughs> it just blows your mind away, really. Um, it isn't open to the public. I'll mention a little bit more about that, but um, it is the largest outcrop of Foxhill sandstone on the Front Range. And uh, <clears throat> it has um, so many different rare plants and animals. The black spleen wart fern is uh, uh, very rare, just found uh, here at White Rocks. And then the next place it's found is in Zion National Park and somewhere in Mexico and Hawaii. And, and then there are some European and African populations, but just so disparate. And, uh, and here it is at White Rocks. Uh, white um, bald eagles, of course, nest there. And there is a closure over the area to allow uh, to protect that nesting habitat each year. And six lined, the six lined racer is, is common in the eastern part, uh, some places in the eastern part of the state, but this is at the far western edge of its range. And there are sandhill communities, um, or at least not, not full on sandhill communities, but many of the plants. Um, and some of the animals that go along with Sandhill Prairie are found at White Rocks. And years ago, um, barn owls were observed nesting in the cliffs. They haven't been observed for some time, but um, they sure are cute up there. <laughs> but but that is um, uh, but it's always a possibility. The 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 alcoves are good nesting sites, and uh, and of course down in the the floodplain habitat for about this time of year, maybe a little, a little bit later. I've seen pelicans and maybe many of you have I'm walking on the White Rocks Trail. They are on the eastern edge of the White Rocks and Great Blue Heron too. And then um, back to the top of the cliffs, the, when it rains or snows, you can have these pools form in, at the top of the cliffs and a uh, fairy shrimp hatch and, um, and spend their whole sort of lifetime and lay eggs before it dries up. And, um, and this whole thing is so exciting when you can, can see that happen. And a few years back, uh, we had Dr. Erin Tripp of the CU Herbarium. She's curator of the herbarium. Um, and a lichen, and lichens are one of her specialties. And she did a survey of white rocks and uh, two new species to science uh, of lichens were found. And I can look the names up for you if you like them, but um, she um, 
named these two new lichens after her collection managers, uh, Dina Clark and Tim Hogan, which is, is really very nice. <laughs> and you can see the spectacular views. Northern leopard frog is another um, species that this is important habitat for. And then I wanted to say that Ricky Weiser, I wanted to make sure I pointed out that she owned this uh, natural area and she was a, a big supporter of the Colorado Natural Areas Program as it got started in the early uh, part of its, you know, in, in the late 70s. And, uh, and this was one of the first natural areas designated. And um, many of you know who Ricky Weiser was, but um, she passed away about 20 years ago now. And, and so some of you might not, but she was a, a Boulder County matriarch and a, a powerful conservationist. It's hard to put her into words. But um, City of Boulder purchased the Weiser property in 2011 after Ricky's passing. And archeological um, studies have shown that um, people have used this area for more than 10,000 years, probably. Um, there are artifacts at the CU Natural History Museum. Um, many of them, they have come from White Rocks. And I, I just take that, this is a, a moment to say that, uh, to acknowledge, uh, I'll just make this statement, um, to acknowledge that we live in the territory of the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations. And according to the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie, that Colorado's front range is home to the Ute and many other native peoples. And that's just a way of recognizing that this not only um, was an important area for Native Americans long ago, but still is in this time now. Um, the Natural Areas Program and OSMP are working on expanding the natural areas boundary uh, to encompass lands, all, all of the lands between 75th Street and 95th Street that have been purchased over the last 10 years and are part of the Open Space and Mountain Parks Program. And this will include several hundred additional acres and the entire expanse of the cliffs, more of the floodplain and riparian and aquatic, aquatic habitat and then a, a sizable restoration opportunity in the gravel mined area on the Ertl property. And this is more or less a closing, <laughs> beautiful shot by Jack Sesson here. Um, uh, just to say that uh, there are guided, this is an area that's closed to the public, except you can see this view and many of you know it well, for, by walking north of Longmont, uh, Longmont, Belmont on the um, White Rocks Trail and crossing the creek. And this is pretty much what you see. And, and with the mountains behind, it's spectacular. But uh, beyond walking on that trail, the area is close to the public, but there are guided hikes that you should really keep an eye out for advertised by OSMP in August, September and October. And, um, and, and so please keep, keep an eye out for those. So um, I really hope this has given you a good glimpse of this small but important state program, the State Natural Areas Program. And then also a reminder of the remarkable biogeographic and biological diversity throughout our state and in our own backyard. And I wanted to just Again, thanks CNEP staff who helped with this presentation and that was Savannah Smith. And I think that's it. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, do you have time for some questions? If you think I do, because I did, it, is, it was a bit of a long- We have a couple in the chat. Um, Carol McCaslin would like to know when visitors are allowed, uh, your, your notes showed that they, they weren't allowed at every site, but when they are allowed, are there restrictions? Do people need reservations? Are there, is there a way to find oh. out? Oh, thank you for mentioning that because that leads me to say um, here on this last slide, you could say, you can see there's an interactive story map to learn about all the 95 natural areas 
And that won't give you um, exactly how to, uh, which, how to get access to them. But you can definitely, at this point, you could Google each site um, and find out more about access. Uh, but the Natural Resource Program is also developing, and it's still in development, a, um, a uh, oh, they have, um, sorry, there's a name for what they're, this, it will be a visitable sites page, <laughs> web page um, on the Natural Areas Program site. And I think that um, Sandra has put in the chat the website for the Natural Areas Program and also for the State Wildlife um, Action Plan, just in case you wanted to be able to refer to that. But please stay tuned for that um, visible sites web page as it um, comes online before long. Great, thank you. Jean-Pierre has a question about restoration. Jean-Pierre, do you want to unmute and ask your question? What, what, what yeah, did you sure. uh, I was wondering if there is any uh, of these uh, natural areas that are in most need of being uh, uh, restored so that whatever uh, species that are thriving there continue to thrive or can be brought back if they left actually those areas. And do you, are you talking about locally or um, across the state? I'm talking about across the state. Yeah. Um, most of these areas are in very good condition. And that's, you know, one of the reasons that they're designated as natural areas. But um, it's, it's certainly worth asking uh, the Natural Areas Program staff if there are opportunities to help with some smaller or larger restoration projects. I'm not aware of any um, at this point. Thank you. There are a couple of questions about um, the, the relationship of these areas to the 30 by 30 um, plan for climate um, change and um, the goal to save 30% of the land by 2030. Well, it certainly seems like it would contribute and you know what I'd really like is a map of Colorado with all of the sites, the, you know, all of the areas that are um, preserved, both, I mean, certainly we can have our, we have maps of our public lands, but including the Nature Conservancy and including some of these private lands that have natural areas on them. And if you could put all of that composite together, I think we could get a better idea of how, um, the natural areas contributes. Uh, you know, there's that large overlap between um, BLM land board, state land board land, and, um, you know, land that essentially is already preserved. But it, it, that's not a terrific answer. But I think it's, it's great for us to be thinking that way. You know, how do we fit into this bigger picture? And the other question related to that is what is the total area of these? 95. Some of the ones you showed were large and some were small. How would they add yeah, up? It's about 180,000 um, acres. And, uh, you know, when the Fox Ranch comes on board, it'll be uh, out in the Eastern Prairie. That was a pretty sizable one. I don't remember the, the acreage, but I think it's um, 7,000 or some acres. So, you know, it's going to inch up. And the, the new state park in the southern part at Raton Pass, the, the, the crazy French, <laughs> Um, that that state park is a great candidate for also designating as a natural area. So that probably would be a large, another large one. Plus um, <laughs> we're adding more of, you know, maybe a couple thousand more acres. I know maybe 1500 more acres as we expand the Colorado tall grass and um, the White Rocks natural areas very soon here in the next year or so. Uh, <clears throat> Jane had a question uh, about the paper birch. Is there still paper birch in Long's Canyon? It is still there. Um, but I, I think the trail reroute route, routes, uh, routes you away from the actual paper birch site. 
And the paper birch has really been ailing and declining. Um, we think partly because, and, and this, is, this is not in my expertise here, uh, my area of expertise, but we think because possibly because of lack of disturbance could be one. And the other has been um, sediment that has come from Flagstaff Road when the roads are sanded and sediment from that sanding then washes down into Long Canyon. And um, the, the county um, transportation and city of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks have been working. We have one, you've probably seen it, one catchment basin done that catches that road uh, material uh, runoff and can be cleaned out and keeps it from going into Long Canyon. But we need a couple of more to really protect the canyons below. Uh, Carol, do you want to ask your question about um, the, the ensuring the pro continued protection and preservation of these lands? Yeah, if I can unmute here. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, these are such treasures and I feel like, you know, there's been so much pressure put on all these lands from the development standpoint and so many of our political leaders not really understanding the importance of these lands. Um, is there something we can do to put pressure on our leaders to say, look, we care about this. And I'm thinking specifically of CU South, guess what? Um, when I saw that picture and it's like, oh my gosh, this is so imperiled. And, you know, is there something we can do as citizens? <clears throat> you know, I, I think that um, for the natural areas program, um, it's had years, um, periods of time when uh, it it nearly folded. It wasn't. It was nearly not funded <laughs> by the state government. Mm. Uh, it it started out directly under the Department of Natural Resources, uh, under 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 the director, and was sort of subject to more of the whims of um, more directly of the state government. Uh, it's very well um, supported now within Colorado Parks and Wildlife. It's, it's probably um, in the best state that it has been, aside from it having too few staff, um, uh, best state that it's been for, uh, for its lifetime, for the 40 plus years. But I think keeping an, a close eye on that, because you can have uh, state government change and the changes that, that might defund the program. So I think it's really important to keep a close eye on, on whether it's being funded properly. And also you can, um, you know, become a volunteer steward. I, I was told by the natural area staff that it, it really is so, um, you know, a, managing volunteers with such a small staff is really challenging mm -hmm. as we all know. And, but if there were some expert birders um, who uh, would like to contact the staff and do some spot surveys here and there, um, that could really help the natural areas program actually, because they, they tend to, the staff tends to be more um, on the botany side of things. They t tend to be more uh, versed in botany and that's it then birds. So that's another thought. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Can I ask a question? Please. It's Linda. Yes. Well, what Lynn just now said has caught my attention because as most of you know, I'm very fond of doing bird surveys. If we were to express an interest to what entity or person would we uh, send that to volunteer? Oh. <clears throat> the, um, Natural Areas Program website was posted there in the chat, I believe. Or you can Google Colorado yes. Natural Areas Program. Okay. And then there's a way to contact by email. Uh, and again, Ra Ra Raquel Wurtzbaugh is the program um, coordinator. 
And I think she would be very receptive. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Would there be some Thank fun you. places to go birding? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's some remarkable places. It was so hard to limit this um, presentation to, to just those <laughs> natural areas. I wanted to take you on a tour of more and more. <laughs> There's so many interesting. Maybe that could be a maybe that could be a future presentation, Lynn. Yeah, just more natural areas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I really would urge you to go onto that um, Colorado Natural Areas website and look. They have a they have a story map. They have, um, you know, they've really recently put out some very user friendly information that just gives you um, beautiful pictures and, and and basic information about each of those natural areas. Have you visited them all, Lynn? <laughs> no, and part of the excitement of putting this presentation together was that some of them I have not, I have not visited. And so um, and I apologize for some of the reading I had to do, but it was in order to cram all this in. But also, um, I'm not familiar with some of these sites. <laughs> Which was your favorite? <gasps> oh, my goodness. I am par so partial to Boulder area, but um, let's see. I do like Zapata Falls a lot. And um, from among these that I mentioned, I guess maybe I'll pick that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lynn, you highlighted um, at the beginning that there, there was a lower density of these sites in the Eastern um, Plains is, are there um, particular places that that should be protected out there that you would highlight or particular kinds of habitats? Um, what are the needs out there on the Eastern Plains? Are we missing some good stuff that ought to be in this program? Yeah. And, and that's where the Natural Heritage Program works with Colorado uh, Natural, uh, excuse me, the Colorado natural areas program to they work together and they also the natural areas program works that has such a network of botanists and wildlife biologists and being part of Colorado Parks and Wildlife as well um, they have quite a network of um, that that can help identify maybe good short grass prairie examples I and mean, really could use I think more of those probably and this addition of the fat Fox Ranch will be quite good, as I mentioned. And of course, that's already a Nature Conservancy site. Anyone else? Um, I, I think we should definitely give Lynn a, a round of applause. And the way we can do that on Zoom is you go to the bottom of your screen, you have a little button called Reactions, and you can choose to give her a thumbs up or a clap or a uh, a bouquet of flowers. So, <laughs> so thanks very much, Lynn. This is terrific. Oh, thank yes. you so much. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Oh, it was just a pleasure. Thanks so much, Lynn. That was just, I learned so much. And do you have the opportunity to look at some of the to retain the chats and yes, I'll, I'll let me know if some people, because I, I noticed that Scott, for instance, was asking about leading an orchid field trip and that kind of thing. So if, if you wouldn't mind sending me absolutely I like that, that, that would be great. Are you still giving field trips? Well, leading through trips? Uh, my work at, uh, with Open yeah. Space and Mountain Park, certainly, and with the Native Plant Society local chapter and you just, yeah, ask me and I probably will oh, good. <laughs> jump okay. at the <laughs> They're Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Yes. It's really fun to be with you all tonight. Thanks, Thanks again. again. Thanks, Thanks so much, Lynn. Yeah. Good night. Fantastic. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Thanks, Sandra. You bet. Yeah. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks so much, Hi, Sarah. <laughs>